accessibility basically in the HRAMS initiative comes at, at the, as the last uh, step, the last, if you like, development in the initiative. It's the very reason why we started this work years ago, but it took us all of that time to actually get there. The reason we want to be able to measure accessibility is obvious to everyone here. I don't think I need to spend a lot of time, but what it means in terms of modeling, it's actually being able to understand how much time people will need to reach any given point where they can access services. Uh, and that means travel time. From that, we can derive also zonal coverage, meaning the number of people that can be covered within a certain time, uh, time threshold from any given point as well as geographical coverage, which is the extent of the geographical area that is covered by any given. So those are three different ways to look at the same measurement. Those models also allow, allow us to start looking into referral times. We've not done that yet uh, in HRAMS, but it's done uh, elsewhere. It implies network analysis. It's slightly more complex, but the same data is required really. So that's not something uh, particularly difficult to add. And the last element I wanted to mention here, which is, I think, a big part of what we're discussing today, it's obviously that kind of information is fundamental for resource allocation and essentially deciding where to deploy additional resources and being in a position to measure the impact that those deployments will have in terms of coverage, which are the areas where people can't access, um, you know, rural reader, uh, ORPs. That's, that's going to be easier. I, I heard this morning through the discussion that the the recommended standard is less than an hour, so that's typically to be discussed this afternoon. So, but say whatever the threshold is, that's typically the kinds of measures we can make here and say, okay, those are the pockets of population that are beyond one hour or whatever threshold we, we choose from the first ORP uh, they can access. And similarly, if we're going to deploy whatever resources we have available, 10, 15, 500, 1000 ORPs, where do we need to locate them so that the coverage is going to be maximal? And retrospectively, we can of course also measure the impact. So say we've not been able to do that upfront, we can always retrospectively go back and say, we've deployed all of those resources, how much more coverage have we gained basically? Um, those models, they've been out for a long time more than 15 years, that's for sure. I joined WHO 15 years ago and I was asked to work on those, uh, but they're really not widespread at all. And the reason behind that is not the models themselves, is the data we need to feed the models basically that is largely not available. So to run those kinds of analysis, we need details on the actual geography of the site, elevation, land cover, barriers to movement, like water bodies, uh, and of course, we need to know the road network to be able to model the, the transportation and the movements of people. We need to have a good idea of population distribution, fairly granular, as well as, as a health ticking behavior. How do people access services uh, in essence? And the last layer on the top is we need to know where the services are located, if they're functional, what sort of where the structures or the points of delivery are, lo are located, if they're functional, what services they're provided. And together with these all sorts of other elements, obviously, who is running them, who is in charge, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And so HRAMS basically was really initiated back then to answer that one question, like to, or develop rather, if you like, the tools that were needed to build that top layer of information that was largely lacking. I won't go through the details here. You have the strategic framework. I think the important point here is the mission. What we're trying to do through the initiative is support countries with the standardization and continuous collection, analysis, and dissemination of that information. So information on what is available and derived from that what is accessible. Standardized because there's a fairly high level of standard. This is not just about a piece of software. There's data standards and also standard processes that have been developed in terms of who needs to collect or report the data, how do we verify, and so on. Uh, but also data models. How do we characterize uh, what we call HSDUs, health service delivery units, because that intends to cover not only fixed structures, but also anything else mobile that may be deployed. I didn't mention that was developed in the emergency program from the very start. And so, you know, with in mind all of the kinds of constraints that we have when we're running emergencies. 
So over the years, and this is still work ongoing, obviously, we're still trying to reinforce, add new services, reinforce the one that exists. That's pretty much the, the package of services we've been working on. We have the norms and standards describing how this should be uh, managed. There's a platform because we're talking about a process where we're going to coordinate inputs from multiple, generally dozens, uh, if not hundreds of partners at the country level. So doing this without the appropriate tool obviously becomes extremely challenging. Continuous country support is planning, um, you know, budgeting, trainings, all sorts of trainings that have been developed on this that we can provide uh, support. And then there's two elements around analytics, descriptive analytics and reporting, an example of which I gave you here. And the second one, which we only started about a year and a half ago through a collaboration with the University of Geneva is the modeling and the accessibility modeling in particular. And that is attached also to the operational research. And then we have coordination and partnerships. Those services, they're not things that we've posted on the web for countries to use and, you know, sort of just run with this and do the best you can. Part of the services are operated centrally when we thought that that was the best way to go about things. So the platform, for example, is a central service. Countries don't need to worry about installing things, hosting, maintaining, debugging everything. It's a joint platform that all the countries that are joining the initiative can use. Standards are also obviously developed and maintained centrally, but in constant discussions with the countries and they're constantly uh, adapted. Then the actual running coordination of the process, uh, everything happens at the country level, everything is decentralized. So we have a support team, region and HQ level, and then really supporting that through a coordination mechanism at the, at the country level. We've run an external evaluation. It's not extremely important, or just to say that it works across the phases of the emergencies. Uh, this is looking at fundamental functions of the health system. So it's not specific to response or preparedness. It's looking at where services are available, how functional the structures are, and that applies to any context really, and was demonstrated um, in, that, in that evaluation. And the other very important point is that this uh, highlighted the fact that it can be deployed really quickly and very efficiently with very little resources. We're not talking about a massive assessments with a lot of you know, logistical constraints and, and basically really long times to get the data through the analysis done and, and so on. So I have an example here of deployment <clears throat> at scale in Afghanistan um, in towards the end of uh, 2021. It basically took us from the moment the decision was taken, very often where we lose most of the time is internally deciding whether we should do it or not, whether we should do something else. Uh, the moment we decided to go, the report of which you have part of an example here was produced a month and a half later. The process was covering more than 4,000 facilities, HSDUs. In this case, we're talking mostly about facilities. And the reporting was done by 48 partners, meaning entities, NGOs that are providing the service and 168 contributors. So that's something very important. I won't go into the details now, but it's service providers that are contributing data to the system collectively. It's not WHO or any third party going out assessing the situation. You have, the, yeah, this is where we work right now, but as I mentioned, you have that on the, <clears throat> on one of the prints, the snapshot of implementation. So no need to spend time. A year and a half ago, so we finally were able to really spend time on the very reason we started this work 15 years ago. So now we have the tools and the experience, uh, you know, and, and all that we need to be able to generate this data in a lot of different contexts. We've deployed to Ukraine as well recently. Uh, so I think we've demonstrated we can get that layer of data that historically we were not able to get. Um, so now that we have this, we're obviously accelerating on the analytics side. The reports is one that's four or five years old, those standard reports, we're producing them regularly. And this, a year and a half ago, we started with the University of Geneva because they have a lot of experience in this accessibility modeling work. And we basically worked on a framework, meaning we looked at the data model from HERANS and we looked at how that could feed these kinds of models. And with the idea of developing something standard and scalable from the, from the start, like we, didn't start this work with a, you know, an idea of uh, sort of researching around the topic. The, the key was really, now we have these spaces, it's fairly standard. 
it's operating in 25 plus countries. Can we find a solution that the modeling is made available as a service as well to all of those countries? And so the conceptual framework describes that. Uh, and, and again, in a year and a half, we've developed a framework and we've already developed models for Afghanistan, Mali, Iraq, uh, Cabo Delgado and Nampula in Mozambique have just come out. They're not here, but that's another one that's come out now. And we're working with Ukraine and Yemen as well. So just to say that this is already in a scalable format, uh, if you like. <coughs> Pardon. I've mentioned that that's the kinds of an, uh, analysis we get basically from the modeling. I won't go back to this, only to add that in addition to the physical access, which is a barrier basically that we're measuring in details through the modeling, there's also other barriers that are being measured through HERAMS, barriers in terms of uh, the supply side of services. So what is preventing suppliers from providing the services that are expected? Lack of staff, lack of training of staff, uh, medical equipment. So that gives a little bit more context when we're looking at the accessibility analysis in terms of some of the barriers that may be faced by the suppliers. And there's also a question on the barriers that the communities face, but that question, bear in mind, is asked to the, the suppliers themselves. So it has limited value, I would say. It's still good for us. It's a flag. It allows us hearing from the providers themselves if they know of any barriers, you know, down at the subnational level. But it, of course, does not replace community-based assessments of what the barriers may be. Um, beyond the modeling, so before we went on working with the modeling, we were already doing those kinds of analysis, obviously, but with less, we would not take into account the transportation network. They were less refined, basically. The analysis was done at the level of administrative units, district, sub-district. We would basically put the number of facilities against the population and try and reach the same kind of understanding. Is our coverage good? That's much less efficient than, um, than the modeling, but still very valuable. And, I wanted to give the particular example of Yemen because that work was done on a cholera outbreak, obviously. And um, and some something we attempted at the time was to basically match the capacities that were monitored through HERAM. So we're talking about the specific cholera response capacities in this case. It's the only time we've done it. Um, to match those to the expected number of cases uh, that would require uh, beds, basically, hospitalization. In this particular case, so estimates were made, were made based on the numbers we were getting through the surveillance system and so on in terms of what the need would be. And we had the numbers in terms of what was available. And so people at the country level, obviously, with that data started prioritizing where resources would need to be uh, deployed. What's this? Okay, that's my last slide. <laughs> yeah, and so uh, so the question, so we discussed that recently uh, with Kate, the work, and and the question was like, is there something that can potentially be of use uh, for cholera? We normally have a single approach that cuts across all of the services, but I think that's one of the very few cases where we do deploy very specific services for a very limited uh, time. And so we were wondering if there may be value thinking about basically leveraging everything that's already ready here, but using that to deploy something that is cholera specific when there is a response, basically, that would help us understand exactly where the, well, first, where the resources that exist are available, where to deploy new resources and to basically keep track. I've seen in the presentation this morning, I think a lot of data on EPI and much less on capacity, but I think it's not just related to cholera. I think there's that distortion we have in a lot of different uh, context and obviously when looking at access we need to also understand what the capacities are on the ground where they're located and what can be done to increase them so that's the idea here and and yeah a question to the group maybe if there's potential to start thinking about this and potentially developing something specific thank you